I like to indulge in conversations with people who I don't necessarily agree with all the time. And I was talking to someone before and I brought up like Jim Crow because I was talking about segregation and they asked me, who is Jim Crow? And I was like, well, you didn't learn about Jim Crow. It's not a person. And um, I just felt bad, honestly, for the lack of education that a lot of people have when it comes to black history, which is just history. Hi, welcome to the Shop Podcast. My name is Caroline. I'm one of your co-hosts. I'm Sarah. I'm your other co-host. Uh, and today, the podcast we are going to be doing a podcast for Black History Month. So, uh, Black History Month actually originated um, as Negro History Week um, in 1915, um, and it was originally a way to kind of just recognize um, all the achievements of this big group of people um, who had until then kind of gone under the radar with all the contributions that they had given to society. And basically since 1976, it's been celebrated every February as a month instead of a week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It focuses on celebrating all the black culture achievements and the prominent figures in history. Yep. Yeah. And it was founded by Dr. Carter G. Woodson. Um, and there are a lot of people uh, who were, have been important to history um, in the US and in the world. Um, and one of them is Thurgood Marshall, who was the first African-American um, on the Supreme Court. Shirley Chisholm, who was the first black woman elected to Congress. There's Dorothy Height, and she was a woman's rights activist. Mm -hmm. And there's Gwendolyn Brooks, who was the first Black author to win the Pulitzer Prize. There's Jane Bolin, and she was the first Black woman to attend mm -hmm. Yale. Uh, and then there's this really interesting story about a woman named Henrietta Lacks, um, who had unfortunately passed away from cervical cancer, but her cells had this unique property where they would like reproduce themselves every 20 to 24 hours. This one was really uh, important for um, research on um, vaccines and um, the effects of like poison and radiation. And um, among other things, they were really integral to the development of the polio vaccine. Lots of interesting people. And I mean, there's hundreds more that we didn't mm -hmm. discuss. We just brought up the ones that we thought were the most interesting, I guess you can say. Yeah, and it's it's really unfortunate um, that these people had, um, their achievements had been ignored for so long uh, yeah. because they obviously made such big impacts to, like I said, the United States and to the whole world. Mm -hmm. It's insane. Mm -hmm. So I guess we can move on to our personal experiences and opinions, which can be controversial, but we'll try to keep it. <laughs> Nice. And now we would like to give a warm welcome to our guest, um, Kira, and we're going to ask her a couple questions um, about her personal experiences and um, her views on the Black Lives Matter movement. Hi, my name is Kiera Cameron, and I am an editor and a part of the creative team for the Shout Podcast. And um, I go to Avonworth High School. I'm a senior, and I'm in charge of two clubs there, Avonworth Cinematics, which is our film club, as well as I'm a co-editor-in-chief for the Avon News. So, Kira, what are your personal experiences um, or opinions when it comes to this sort of stuff and Black History Month? Some of my opinions on Black History Month, I really think that there's a lot in school that should be taught um, that isn't. And I remember Mr. Warren saying, actually last episode, that Black History is just history. And so really it should be integrated into our everyday education system, but unfortunately it's not, which is why having a month dedicated to Black History is important because we don't learn enough about it. Actually, I like to indulge in conversations with people who I don't necessarily agree with all the time. And I was talking to someone before and I brought up like Jim Crow because I was talking about segregation and they asked me, who is Jim Crow? And I was like, well, you didn't learn about Jim Crow. It's not a person. And um, I just felt bad, honestly, for the lack of education that a lot of people have when it comes to black history, which is just history. And there's a lot of things I'm probably ignorant on with like Japanese history or Mexican history um, in all facets of life. Definitely Native American history because um, our textbooks definitely talk about it in uh, specific ways that aren't always true. 
so when it comes to Black History Month um, and everything that's involved with it, I really believe that it should be taught more, that we should integrate it throughout the entire year, not just in a month. Because again, Black History is just history. And going over things like uh, you guys just did, having those names, you know, I didn't even know half of those names that you guys brought up. So I think it's really important to get the names of big influential people out there especially if they haven't been talked about, especially when they're minorities, because a lot of that gets sweeped under the rug, and it's really important to make sure that we tell history history accurately. And um, I think having that education and a well-rounded, truthful view of history will be really integral to having people grow up and grow up appreciating other cultures instead of having hate in their heart. All right, so, you know, that was honestly such an honest response um so i know that well we know that you had participation in the black lives matter movement this summer so can you talk to us a little bit about that yeah so over the summer i went to a few blm protests i actually take photos at my school i'm a school photographer and i have like my own uh, kind of like side business with it and so I went to some of the protests and I was able to go down there completely peaceful um, for every event I went to. I actually went downtown Pittsburgh during like the first day that we had curfew. And so I was there a few minutes before curfew was ending and I saw people grouping together and there was a heavy police uh, presence there. And it was very tense. You know, you could definitely see that there was a lot of animosity. Obviously, people were, were very upset and still are very upset. But I saw a sense of community when I went down there because, again, it was 100% peaceful protest that I attended. So whenever I went there, I saw a lot of community and a lot of people banding together to try to make a change for something good and in a peaceful manner. And then I went to another protest that wasn't downtown. Um, but I went there and people had their signs and people were giving testimonies and speaking. And I found it really powerful to hear firsthand accounts and ways as well to try to help the issues at hand. Because a lot of times people will talk down about BLM or something like that, say there's not real change or there's no real solution. But a lot of people were giving real solutions um, during these presentations and presenting it with stats and things to back it up and so capturing those moments through pictures was really important to me and I enjoyed being down there a lot and I felt at home. Thank you for that uh, that great answer um, and then for our last question um, I wanted to ask you um, how you think that um, non-black people could be better allies to the Black Lives Matter movement and black people in general. Yeah, so to be a better like ally for black people, um, if you're not black or like white or, you know, just not African American, I think it's really important to you guys spoke on it earlier, but to amplify black voices and then make sure that people are able to speak. It's not always going to be something you agree with, but just making sure that we have that open dialogue is really important. And that honestly goes with all people of all different races, but specifically black people, because a lot of times our voices aren't heard as much. I mean, even just talking about what I said earlier about the history not being taught properly or not being taught enough is right there not letting black people have their spot in history like they're supposed to and not allowing us to be able to speak and have our place i mean there's a lot of parts in history that are twisted and it wouldn't have been twisted if black people were allowed to be given a voice a platform and i think it's getting much better now but as we see with the things in the summer and blm there's still a lot of things we have to work on and i'm excited though for the prospects of being able to do that um, because I think there's a lot that we can get done, and I think it's really important to get it done. And um, I think with this new generation as well, you know, coming up like my generation specifically, we're a lot more accepting than like our uh, ancestors. And so hopefully, you know, of course there's still a lot of animosity between us, but I'm hoping that we're able to band together and make a change for something, especially with BLM protests blowing up this year and really... Um, enforcing that we want a change and we're going to get a change. So thank you for um, coming and being on our podcast and giving us um, your views on all the things that we're talking about. 
And now we're going to move on to the Black Lives Matter movement. Yeah, so, you know, a lot of people that at least I've spoken to think that the Black Lives Movement started just, you know, in the past few years, last year to be specific. Yeah, but the the Black Lives Matter movement actually originated in July of 2013 um, after the police officer who uh, murdered Trayvon Martin was acquitted for his crime and he didn't end up getting charged with anything. But uh, as you said, it, it resurfaced in 2020. Um, as a result of the killing of George Floyd on May 25th. And now and, there's the yeah, whole sorry. aspect of Black Lives Matter versus All Lives Matter, which is just a whole nother topic on its own. I mean, honestly, the people who, you know, created All Lives Matter, they're saying, you know, we can't put one race first, but the truth is, you know, you have to think about who needs the most safety and priority first. Like you wouldn't tell someone who was sick that, you know, oh, you're sick, but these diseases are important too to treat. Like you would want to focus your attention on the person who was sick, not someone else. Yeah, and um, Black Lives Matter um, is not about putting Black people above other people. It's about... Um, giving them equality um, after all the prejudice that they have faced for hundreds of years uh, in this country. I mean, it's about time that they get the equality and recognition mm -hmm. that they deserve. I mean, come on. Yeah, and, um, and All Lives Matter really only exists um, in order to oppose Black Lives Matter. A bunch of people were just like, oh, we don't, we don't like that. You want to say that Black Lives Matter? Um, and so we're just going to oppose you because we don't think Black Lives Matter or something like that. It's, it's just insanity. Yeah. Um, and another kind of slogan that has come up um, with the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement is the um, defund the police. Um, uh, but, and I, I know a lot of people think that defunding the police means abolishing them. And I know that is something that some people want to do. Um, but I think at its core, it's about taking the funds that they do have and putting them back in to give more better training to the police so that they're more yeah, sensitive exactly. to mental health. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just about making sure that the people who we have in law mm -hmm. are proper and that they're going to do the right thing when it comes to it. It's yeah, not saying, you know, they don't matter. Like, they, they, they can't do their job. It's no, they have to have better training and have more of a conscience when they're doing it. Yeah, because their their job is to protect and serve the communities that they police in. Um, and if they aren't doing that, then that's not proper. And um, we know that according to the U.S. Census Bureau, um, Black people make up 13.2% of the population, but 31.7% of arrest-related homicides, uh, which is, it, it doesn't make sense. And I know a lot of people, um, when we say that, hey, Black people are being killed at an un unjust rate. Uh, really, no one should be being killed. But a response that I've heard is white people are getting killed by the police too, and they are, but it's proportionally Black people are getting killed more than their exactly. population is. And I think a lot of um, the people who kind of have this opposition to Black Lives Matter um, do it from a place of white privilege. And a lot of them say that they don't have white privilege, but white privilege is really everywhere. Exactly. Yeah. Like I know one specific aspect that um, I have white privilege um, is, this might seem kind of shallow, but in hair, um, I know there have been like schools that have yeah. not let um, like black girls or just people who have like natural curly hair, not let them wear like dreads or braids and I know that when I go into like the working world as an adult I won't have to worry about that mm -hmm. and another thing is just simply going into a store or driving I mean we don't have to worry about being pulled over or questioned if we're stealing something but you know anyone who's black has that risk attached to them yeah uh, and I know in the labor market as well is um, somewhere else that um, Black people and people of color in general are also impacted um, a lot in unemployment. Um, like Black people yeah. are often 
um, their unemployment rate is higher than white people. Um, and that is before and after the pandemic as well. I mean, the whole difference in just the payment and the whole employment, unemployment is just insane to look at once you pull up the information and the stats, like, just wow. Yeah. Yeah, like, it's it's hard to read, but it is, it's just the numbers, and it's been happening for uh, many years. And um, this, this unemployment issue has been going on um, for ever really, you will always see that um, the black black population um, and African-American population always had, there's this big gap between them and the average. Yeah. I mean, honestly, it's awful just to think that like someone doesn't get a job because of how they are and it's something that they can't change about themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, one of the, the best ways that we can try and educate ourselves about this kind of stuff is um, by both speaking to Black people and amplifying their voices so that more people can hear their stories. Yeah, I mean, it's not that hard to put someone of color in a position where they can speak out, because mm -hmm. anyone who is white can do that, but, and they, well, they can get backlash, but they don't get as much as people who are Black who speak out about injustices and truly anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, the judgy stares that they get just for saying their own mind, that's mm -hmm. ridiculous. Yeah. And um, and we obviously, as we kind of talked about earlier, um, all the different people, um, the, those, um, the first Black woman to attend Yale and the, the first African-American Supreme Court justice, like all this stuff, it didn't happen that long ago. Um, and it's the same thing with um, like segregation, where it really didn't end that long ago. I mean, even the civil rights movement with Martin Luther King, I mean, that wasn't that long ago, but people trying to paint it into the past where they say, oh, it was so long ago, but truly, it really wasn't. I mean, yeah, that's what's just so insane is that people try to push it and say, oh, it didn't happen that long ago. This wasn't happening that long ago. But in reality, it's only like 30, 40 years ago when the movement truly, truly started. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like it was only in um, in 1964 uh, that the Civil Rights Act was passed in order to not be able to discriminate against people um, based on like race, sex, yeah. um, gender, all that stuff. Um, and it really, it wasn't that long ago. And I think that's why um, it kind of still trickles down into today is because there were obviously still um, people alive today who were alive um, before that. Um, mm -hmm. so. And who were sole witnesses to the whole movement. And yet some of those people still aren't in the position where they feel like they can be accepted or they can accept other people. And that's just what's so, I guess, painful to see is that people are just so cruel to other people. Mm -hmm. So... Um now that we, especially since uh, Black Lives Matter had this big resurgence in 2020, um, I know a lot of people are searching for great ways to um, help amplify Black voices, like I said before, um, and help the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, and I know um, the Shout organization has um, done a lot to help that. So Sarah, could you kind of go through yeah. what they've done? Definitely. So Shout, the whole premises of it was created because of a racist incident involving a white male and a black male at our high school. And it's just, it's completely evolved and having the opportunity for, to have a, a place in the school district where you can feel safe and you can go to and you can stand up for what you believe in. I mean, that's what it's all about. And we have this motto where we say, hand prints, heal prints, and that means any positive act can overturn a negative one. And one of the most incredible things that we were able to do was during the summer where we had a Black Lives Movement rally. We got so many people to come, and I personally wasn't a part of the group at that time, so I am I know the whole story from other people, but um, they had student speakers who were Black, and it was just, it was a hit, and that's really where Shout started to gain its traction was from that, and of course, it was completely COVID safe. Everyone was wearing masks, social distance, but 
the fact that a group of students was able to put something like that on and use their voices to stand up for what they believe in, I mean, it's it's the coolest thing ever. Yeah, and I know um, other ways to help, especially, um, like you said, it was important um, that the shout um, Black Lives Matter um, movement um, protest or rally, um, it was important to be COVID safe. Um, so other ways that you can kind of um, stay safe in your house and um, help the movement is to um, sign petitions. I know there are a lot on change.org in order to um, have your voice heard and um, help amplify other voices. Uh, and we are also going to put some resources in the description of this video that um, you can go to um, to um, educate yourself about the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and we will also have all of our sources for this video linked in the description there, so you can check those out. You can make sure that we're not spreading lies. Yeah. Okay, so um, thank you for listening to um, this podcast or watching this podcast. Um, if you want to um, learn more about Shout or about the Black Lives Matter movement, um, we will have um, the social media accounts for Shout uh, linked in the description below. One really cool thing about the social medias is that during the month of February, we're doing a Black Lives Matter, um, Black History Month sort of spree of posts where every single day we're going to feature a prominent Black person in history. So you should definitely check that out. And yeah, thank you so much for just listening to us ramble and just try to use our voices to spread acceptance and equality. Yeah. And Shout has some future events uh, that you guys can look forward to. Women's History Month, or as we like to say it here at Shout, Women's Her Story Month uh, and the Uncommon Conference. And there's going to be a lot more to come after that. So just stay tuned and keep with us. Make sure to check back for updates. And once again, thank you so much for listening, watching, witnessing. I mean, whatever you're doing to hear this. Thank you.